Hope and Patience with Amelia Rope, a podcast about business, well-being and chocolate. Hello and welcome to our end of series special episode of Hope and Patience. It's fab to have you here and if you're new to the show, the hugest of welcomes. Just to give you the heads up, If you sign up to the H&P newsletter, you're in with a chance of winning one of our chocolate bars. What's our special for this series? It's exploring the story of a charity, social enterprise, which is very close to my heart and one which I committed to as a business volunteer mentor a few years ago. Since 1997, this charity has worked with over 7,500 prisoners, training them to do high quality, skilled and creative stitching in their cells, enabling them to earn money, skills and self-belief. Our guide today is a woman who joined their founder in the very early days and transformed a germ of an idea into the award winner it is today. She was also awarded the OBE in 2016 for her service to the rehabilitation of offenders. Collaborations have included working with Ai Weiwei, Kit Kemp, who's founder of the Firmdale Hotel Group, Kath Kidson, Patrick Brill, Aka Bob and Roberta Smith, and bespoke commissions include Selfridges, Stella McCartney, Gavin Turk, the v and the author Tracy Chevalier. So time to find out more from our guest today, Katie Emp, founding director of Fine Cell Work. Hello and welcome to H&P, Katie. Hello, Amelia. So Katie, how did Fine Cell Work begin? Whose idea was it? It was the idea of someone called Lady Anne Tree, who was a long-standing prison visitor and very, very lovely and very original and quite grand. And she started prison visiting in the 50s. And she had this idea probably in the 60s. She was actually, she was Myra Hindley's prison visitor. I mean, she was a, you know, she was a great woman. And she had this idea, she used to talk about her outside interests to prisoners because their worlds were so narrow, you know, and so dull and so tormented, you know, a mix of all those things. And she used to talk about her hobbies, one of which, and things she liked, and one of which was needlework. And she actually, she was visiting a lifer and she actually brought in some of her needlework and said, would you like to learn this? And that's how it started. And two lifers made these huge needlepoint carpets that were sold in the 70s for £10,000 each. So what, it would be four times that amount now. Really, really valuable, beautiful carpets that were sold through Colfax and Fowler, which was Lady Anne Tree's family firm of interior decorators. And she could not, and she tried to get some of the money from the proceeds of the sale of these carpets, which kept the prisoners sane, and they really enjoyed it, and it gave them a meaning to their days, etc., etc. And she kind of could not get through the prison bureaucracy to pay them. And then she sort of battled away for years writing to people with her idea for a charity, and she kept on sort of getting the door slammed in her face. And she had amazing contacts. Her cousin was kind of a very senior minister, and you know, she was she she, she knew people, mm-hmm. but even so, people just didn't want to listen. And then finally, in 1995, through her daughter Izzy Tree, who's who's a friend of mine, someone called Robert Oakshot, who was a wonderful man in his own right, basically helped her open the door and get a meeting with the minister, the the minister of prisons at that time, who gave the thing the go ahead. And so she got, she had help. It was really hard to get through the bureaucracy. And that wasn't her thing. You know, she was this imaginative, just kind of a complete one off and a lovely person and very passionate and very clever. But she wasn't someone to deal with kind of systems and politicians. And anyway, the charity got given the go ahead And then two years later, I came on board in a very small way. We had £2,000 in the bank and it was a one day a week job. And I was kind of hastily handed these, this this folder of um, letters, which were actually a lot of them quite irate (laughs) (laughs) between Lady Anne and Robert and, and various kind of governors and prison officials trying to get the scheme going. And, um, having, it's like a, a bit of, it's like trying to fight your way through a thorny hedge. So that's kind of how it started. And for me, it was something I just learned to do as I learned, went along. And I learned from our volunteers who I kind of found these needle women through the WI and the lo- local churches and all sorts. And they were people who were, they were amazing people, really, our early volunteers. And, and or they still are, all of them. But these women were kind of quite, quite very courageous. There wasn't really a sort of roadmap for how to do it. 
and they, they were good at needlework, and they saw that it could help prisoners, and they decided they want to do it. So they immediately had sort of overcome the prejudices that we carry. They saw, I can work with prisoners. And I, I only ever had one volunteer who sort of backed out when I took her to prison. And that's out of um, scores and scores of volunteers. So they've sort of done, they've sort of gone the extra mile in their heads, like this is, a, this is a thing I want to do. And they have to be confident in their skills because, like, would you go into prisons promising to teach needlework if you weren't very good at it? No. <laughs> it would be too uh, intimidating. <laughs> How did the male prisoners respond to something that I suppose is mainly or used to be quite mm. female based stitching, yeah. tapestry? Exactly. Was there a stigma against it or not? Well, the most interesting thing is that a lot of, a lot of men wanted to do it. And if there was a stigma, we heard more We heard more about it from the officers who'd make jokes about it, kind of tease the prisoners. Mm -hmm. And essentially, I think they were so desperate, many, many people in prison, men, and it's 97% men in prison, the, the female prison population is very small, they just, they're just desperate for something to do. And the, and the incentive of extra money is important. So the, the kind of core thing of Lady Anne's idea, which was really important and really sort of liberated and liberal of her, was that the prisoners had to get paid for top quality work. And it had to be top quality and they jolly well were going to get paid for it. And they should be able to save when they get out because she had seen, she had met prisoners at the prison gate who were just desperate, like scared to cross the road or to go in a shop and who had 40 quid and no accommodation and really dreadful situations often. Was she one of the first to get the prisoners the pay for work? I'm not sure that she was, but I think I think prisoners were already paid. They, they do get paid small amounts for prison work, which they can use for cigarettes and extra food and phone calls. But it's very, you know, so the average prison wage is eight pounds a week. But she was very insistent that they could save from this money. And someone who's up and running with us can easily double their prison income. So imagine, prison is poultry, all your expenses are paid in prison, and then you have a bit extra for this is and that. It's perfect, you know, it's nothing, it's £8 a week, say, or £10 a week. If you can double that, you really can save. And many, and we work with people who are, are so good that they you know, they can generate a proper nest egg for when they get out, which could be anywhere between a thousand and five thousand pounds, I would say over over quite a few years. And they, they may have worked kind of 20 to 30 hours a week for that money. So it's not it's not remotely a living wage. And yet in prison, the work is a great solace to them. It's creative, it's satisfying, they get all these thank you letters from customers. And at the same time, there's a satisfaction that there is money that they can give to their family or save for release or just use to make life in prison more bearable. And it's something that they've really earned. They really have. I mean, they, they, get, they get paid on return of a piece if it's of the right quality. And so, so it's a boost to self-worth because it's very, very genuine. What they're doing is, is good <laughs> and it is the work of their own hands. And no one is telling them to do it either. It's completely their own choice. And they do it in their own time when they're locked in their cells, you know. And Katie, is your background in the prison service at all? How, you know, what was it that appealed to you? Well, my background was that my very first job, which is a very sort of weird job in a way, was after kind of doing an English degree at university, I met this prison theatre company that worked in American prisons at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And I was just completely sort of hooked really and the, the director was very charismatic and they did amazing work it's kind of live improvised very sort of edgy shows that got the prisoners sort of answering back and interacting with the actors anyway so that's what I did that was my first job in America I, I did theatre in American prisons and we also taught theatre and got prisoners to put on their own plays and I then I did this in England as well we set up a sister company and which is still going and is very much a part of the system now so I guess what I had was I, I, I wasn't scared of prisons and I had, a, I did have, I, something had drawn me to them. And also um, uh, I wasn't scared of like a startup actually because I've been part of one mm -hmm. and I had seen just that it's possible to create something out of nothing. And this, you know, I mean, the, the, the theatre company I worked for really was in a world apart and it did quite extraordinary work. So anyway, so I kind of, the £2,000 a week, <laughs> the £2,000 and the day a week job. I was doing other work at the time. Uh, I, I was teaching and doing bits of journalism. 
I guess I could just cope with it. And it was all just very new. And prison, I kind of like prison in a funny sort of way. How easy has it been to grow fine cell work? <laughs> well, well, you know, in the early years, it was surprisingly easy. And when I started it, I mean, I did have people, including a prison governor or two, sort of either be very dismissive or kind of laugh in my face, the idea of prisoners doing needlework. And, and friends were quite dismissive about it. And, and it just seemed such an unlikely idea. And the funny thing was that from, the, from very early on, it worked. And what it was was that these nice, brave, competent needlewomen, when prisoners wanted to do it, and that their teachers, the volunteers, formed a bond with them, and the prisoners enjoyed it, and they wanted and needed the money. And they, they just really enjoyed having something to do, and they found it very satisfying. So actually, my experience was that when I, in the first year when I did it, I was, it was still, I don't know, six months old, and I suddenly had 40 prisoners on the books. And it was this part-time job with, with no infrastructure whatsoever, no office, nothing. And suddenly there was this workforce and other prisoners wanting to do it. And the way I kind of grew it was really that anyone who, any, anyone who said they wanted to teach in prison, I would take on. <laughs> like, great. And the lovely thing about it, for me, it was a very rewarding experience, was that just that responsibility and that creativity that really did belong to the volunteers and the prisoners to sort of make a group. It, it, it created great things. And they did from early on produce very good work that we could sell. And from very early on, we did commissions through Lady Anne's um, contacts. So she used to call it the, the decorating trade. <laughs> through the decorating trade, we kind of had links to some of London's best interior designers, who Lady Anne sort of knew through Colfax and Fowler. And they gave us commissions. And the skills, mm, the mm. skills are just amazing. Mm, I mean, they mm. what the offenders create is mm. incredible. Yes, it is quite wonderful. And, 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 and I suppose when I started, I had the prison thing, but I didn't really know much about needlework. And I actually had a rather patronising attitude to it. I thought it was probably rather easy, a bit like painting by numbers. And so, yeah, I grew. And then I started to realise that actually each... Each embroiderer's stitching is almost like handwriting. So it, it has a different quality. It's, it's highly individual, you know, and that was so sort of touching and interesting, as well as the pride they took in the work. And people wanted it. So we started selling it through friends at the Houses of Friends, which essentially, it was, that's a thing we still do. We have what we call house sales, where some nice person will have an event at their house and get a committee together, invite all their friends. Anyway, honestly, within a couple of years, we'd have people quarrelling over, over cushions. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sort of another thing one learned was that it, it made people talk and think about the cause in a very sort of natural way. People did their own thinking. So they would look at this cushion, they would look at these things and say, they can't be all bad if they did something that beautiful. And so one realised that the product was a kind of ambassador and it made people use their imagination and their hearts. And it sort of broke through some of that the stigma and the us and them feeling and the fear as well about people in prison. These things kind of spoke in their own way. And I think for the and many of the prisoners, I mean, they're just right from the start. So I learned from them like I learned from the volunteers. They would just talk about this feeling of calm and of time passing. And customers would start and write to thank them. It was also sort of just so incredibly nice. And all this kind of tabloid stuff about prisoners and crime and fear and the divisiveness around the, the discourse around criminal justice. Somehow this sort of leapt over it and um, people behaved in this incredibly empathetic way and the prisoners would talk in an empathetic way about the customers you know so they would say it gave them pleasure to think that they were doing something for someone else and it gave them pleasure to be giving back so it sort of unlocked this extraordinary goodwill and the need for connection that we all have. What skill set would you say that you've needed to draw on? Uh, well I think I think I just had to be incredibly adaptable and flexible and in the early days, I learned to do the books. <laughs> I kind of wrote my first grant. I just did everything. And because I was young enough, actually, I could just sort of, I just picked, it up, picked things up. And I, but I think what I did have was I was able to articulate it. I mean, after a couple of years, I think it was about two years in, it became a full-time job or three years in. 
and became a huge part of my life. And I was able to, so I was passionate about it and I believed in it. And I think if you can explain things and you believe in them, I think it's important. Sincerity is important. And Lady Anne was also very sincere. With the pandemic, how have you managed with volunteers going in, kits going in and out? Ah, oh. <laughs> well, actually, in a funny sort of way, it's like fine cell work. It was, made, it was made for lockdown, right? I mean, Lady Anne really knew at first hand, as a visitor, how tormented prisoners can be when they're locked in their cells and cut off from their loved ones and desperately anxious and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and often riven by guilt and shame as well. So suddenly with the pandemic, there was a 23-hour lockdown in prisons, which is really quite shocking. I mean, that's that exceeds the UN's kind of limits. That That is solitary confinement, according to the UN. And it's been going on for more than a year. And this made it even more important that we got work to the prisoners so that they could kind of survive being locked up in this tiny space for all but one single hour a day. And we kind of mobilised the amazing, now a very professional structure and team. And there was this huge kind of mail out, literally two days before the national lockdown of kits. We made them en masse, like, you know, 700 of them, 600 of them. And they got sent to prisons all over the country to prison staff who we mobilised and said, please give these to the prisoners. And actually what, what it created was that we ended up, so our volunteers just weren't allowed to go into prison. The prisoners were locked in their cells for 23 hours a day. The whole thing was in kind of gridlock, but there were still officers and staff obviously manning the prisons. And so we worked more closely with them and we made sure that we could get work to everyone who needed it. And we have sustained our service throughout the lockdown where a lot of charities simply haven't been able to and rehabilitation has just gone. So it's been important and it's been incredibly, I think, kind of moving and, and heartening for us to be able to do that. And I think it's helped us understand what we do better. And some amazing, amazing work has come back. That, that said, I would also say that actually our workforce has dropped off and it's gone down by half. And what that is about is that they have become, a lot of our workers have become very demotivated because they have no one encouraging them. They have no social contact. And actually, we know how that feels from our own experience of lockdown. Mm. And then imagine times 100 when you're in your prison cell. And frankly, they've just they've become depressed and demotivated and discouraged. And so that also has shown us how incredibly important our volunteers are and the kind of teamwork aspect of what we call the cell groups. They meet fortnightly. They bring their work. They discuss it. They share it. They get feedback. They get new kits. And it's energizing and they get taught, you know, they get taught to do new stitches and skills so they can take on ever more challenging pieces of work. When, when do you think that the volunteers can go back in to have their groups again? Well, the brilliant thing is it started. It's, it's very piecemeal, but slowly it started. Uh, so we've got a couple of prison groups now opening. We know that more will open in June and July, but we run, I think it's now about 26 prison groups. So it's it's slow, it's piecemeal. And what we heard about the first reopened prison group in a prison in the West Country was that the prisoners came to the class, the first one after more than a year of lockdown, mm. but they didn't stay. So they just kind of, they just came in, picked up their kits and went. That's and I thought shame. about that. And I, yeah, and I just thought, well, that's it, isn't it? It's kind of like this loss of sociability, this loss of that feeling of, community and being able to talk to people so we're going to have to figure out how to how to bring back that so, so it also tells you actually how important the social side of the class what 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 we heard from prisoners before the pandemic was how important it was to them to feel part of a team and that's a really big part of it and we had we do now these amazing newsletters which I have to say are sort of read by with interest by sort of merchant bankers and <laughs> they're really good. We do these prisoners they are and newsletters, aren't they? Yeah. Um, for, for prisoners with fantastic pictures, fantastic information about embroidery and rehabilitation and crosswords and competitions and stories about the fine cell work legacy and all sorts of things. And that has been to build the sense of identity and belonging for our stitchers. And it's succeeded. So anyway, we've worked hard for them to, to, even though they're in prison and they are guilty and they've been shamed and they're carrying all these 
things, as well as often very, often very acute personal problems. They, they're part of something successful and they belong and they're accepted. But the pandemic seems to have eroded that. That's what I'm saying, in spite of our best efforts. So during the pandemic, we were writing monthly to every single prisoner individually with feedback and encouragement. We gave awards. We gave a bonus for some extraordinary work we did at Sotheby's, which we might talk about later. We did all, you know, so we, re- we did everything we could to keep them engaged. But, but I think the loss of that social contact has been very hard. Do you think it's a thing where they it's creating a habit again so that if they see that the volunteer classes are running on a regular mm. basis and they start to re-engage, that they will build up that routine that they had before? Um, yes, I think so. I think I think it will rebuild. But we're just it's still a bit of an unknown. It's it kind of what the true impact of the pandemic and the, 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 the 23 hour lockdown has been on people. And there are indications that it, it, it definitely has created mental health, prob- you know, exacerbated mental health issues. So, so I, I think we, we will rebuild it. We're absolutely confident we will. But it, it's all a bit of it's just new terrain. And everyone has been affected. And really, it's just it's just actually our first volunteers starting up a new class. What you have is a bunch of strangers in a room together who may feel a little self-conscious and not very confident. And slowly you re- you build up that trust and that mutual support and the skills as well that give this feeling of confidence. And, and some of that has been lost in the pandemic. So in a way, what, what, may, what it may be is that we're sort of almost restarting classes. Mm. Even, though there, even though there are experienced stitches in them, there's an element of just starting again and building that sense of ease and trust and pride. So, Katie, what's your biggest frustration with the prison service as it stands today? Um, I, my biggest frustration is that I really think it should be seen as prison should be seen as a chance to change. I, I think it is a punishment and I think it has to be a punishment. Justice absolutely has to be administered. But I think that I think the kind of from the top prison should be seen as a chance for people to change. And, and it's not really it's it's kind of tied in knots about security, which obviously is important and sort of managing populations and the the workforce i would say is probably not paid well enough and not trained well enough and they should be because honestly crime is just gigantic you know the mm. cost to society is gigantic in terms of harm and in terms of the, there is a cost a huge cost to the taxpayer too and there are other prison systems that work better with better rehabilitation and there is a significant proportion of people who offend who might not offend again if if prison worked differently and that's, that's what you need to be thinking about. So I just think prisons ought to be about rehabilitation. And I think they're communities. And I think they should be seen as communities. And what, what I learned, to my surprise, when I was just kind of new in the job, was that prisoners helped each other. And they helped our volunteers. And many of them did things for charity. And it was important to them, actually, to feel like they weren't total outcasts. And, and so somehow prison needs to address that issue. Because they, they've been greatly shamed and punished. That, that, that's been done, this kind of idea that prisons are holiday camps. Utter rubbish. I, I mean, imagine if you kind of, you were like, you went to prison, you're like, God, oh, this is great. This is so much better than home. I mean, what kind of a home do you have? And I've met people who almost feel that way. And, and that, is, that is their tragedy. So I think, I think it's a, a question of values and the top value Punishment has been administered. They, they have been judged and sentenced and they're inside. But I think once they're inside, the issue of, of personal change should be just what the whole institution is about. Which leads me on to a programme that I am involved in mentoring for mm. and one that I think is just incredible, which is your Open the Gate programme, which yeah. has recently been awarded the highly recommended Robin Corbett Award for your work integrating prisoners into the community. Yeah. How easy, Katie, is it for them to reintegrate? I mean, I, I obviously only have my fantastic mentees, you know, insight into this and it's horrified me. But, you know, what are your what are your insights on it? On 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 release from prison and the needs. Yeah, and and reintegration and yes, how easy yeah. it is to to be given a second chance and yeah, to get yeah. a job and and rebuild again. Mm. Well, it's a communism that being released from prison is like a second sentence, 
And what we see over and over again is people, well, people sometimes get out and they're very, very scared of release because their families have rejected them. They're terrified to meet friends. They can't get a job back. But a lot of people also get out of prison and they're excited. They think they've done their time and they think they've changed. And, and, and the world views them with tremendous fear and prejudice. So that kind of hope is, is dashed over and over and over again. And it's very hard for them to get jobs. They have to dis- disclose their crimes. Mm. People can do DBS checks on them. And what we find, actually, is that ex-prisoners can be the best, the best workers. You know, they're so bloody grateful for the job. And many of them just want to prove themselves. They just want to be accepted again. I mean, I think we underestimate just how ghastly it is to be outcast, to be branded. Um, it's, it's a very effective tool. So they have been branded and most of them want not to be. Do you see what I mean? They they just want to be included again and normal. Yeah. It's difficult because Mm. from my experience is that from my mentee is that they Mm. can these judgments from outside come back in all different disguises. So as soon as Mm. they've taken one step forward, there'll be something that pushes them back. And there there seems to be that vulnerability where if they get themselves into a really deep, dark hole again, they are more likely to re-offend because in a way they just think, you know what, it's far easier inside than out. And that to me is a real tragedy. I have seen that so many times, Amelia. I really have. Of prisoners kind of hitting barrier after, ex-prisoners, sorry, hitting barrier after barrier to reintegration and feeling rejection over and over again. And I've just heard them say, I'd rather be back inside. Mm -hmm. And I remember one ex-prisoner said to me, he basically said, in prison, I was respected. In prison, I had an identity and a role. It was actually, as I was saying, prisons are communities. People aren't all bad. They do help each other. They do form friendships. They do have common activities, you know, all all that sort of thing. And, and, And suddenly you come out and it just feels like no one wants to know you or will accept you. And I think the other thing, actually, is that the profound lack of confidence. So along with the fact that there's this prejudice against you and sort of fear because you've been inside and you've committed a crime. And I think there's also the, the lack of confidence. So, so that on the inside for the ex-offender who has been taken out of society and judged and, and punished. So actually, just like with a child, you would need to rebuild confidence a true confidence, which is because most people want to be good. The kind of like the ideal villain is the villain who says, I want to be bad, you know, like, like despicable me. They don't really exist, though. I mean, anyway, they're very few, right? People aren't in control of themselves. Yeah, wrong time, wrong place, wrong emotion. Yeah, some, yeah exactly. And, and, and uh, some people simply also just are in the grip of things that they can't control. But if they had more confidence in their ability to control themselves... I mean, deep, proper confidence, then you'd get less crime. And if they are shamed and disabled, it's like, well, who am I? All I am is this offend, is this nasty offender. You take more control away, they're going to behave with less control as well. So I think confidence and a sense of control are very, very important in rehabilitation. And I think that our unlikely needlework program gives that. They work when they want to in their cells. They gain a real confidence because they do beautiful work that's in interior design magazines and goes into museums and they get thank you letters from customers and it's widely, it's very reputable, high quality work. So that confidence is really in them. It's not a false confidence. It's, um, it's because they've done something good. So we need to be looking at that. So, Katie, with the pandemic and mm. sales and um, fundraising and all that element, which is mm. absolutely vital to mm. find cell work, how have you all been coping? Well, we were incredibly lucky in the pandemic because about a third of Fine Cell Works income comes from sales of prisoners products and 70% is from donations and grants. So we we are proper charity, um, but we do make money back through sales of the prisoners work and we pay them for their work and we can cover the cost of materials and we make a little back as it were that goes back into the charity and back into rehabilitation but sales obviously dipped dramatically in lockdown and we could not have fundraising events and it was very frightening indeed and our executive director uh, Victoria Gillies did the most amazing job of holding people together when everyone was working from home and the team did as well of keeping prisoners supplied with work 
and of managing to sort of keep morale up. Uh, meanwhile, as it were, the money was just draining away, you know, because a lot of our usual means of bringing money in month on month to the charity had been disabled. So it was a challenging time, but we did, uh, we were able to continue with grants fundraising, which was very fraught. And amazingly, sales did quite well. I mean, they didn't do, they, they were down on what we had planned and expected, but um, basically everyone was shopping online and everyone was, I think it was a kind of empathetic mood abroad, wasn't there? Mm-hmm. And so, our, and we had an amazing web sales, ma- sales manager, brilliant, who did all these things she had never had time to on the website because she'd been busy with kind of selling through events as well. And uh, the website just flourished and sales went up through the website, went up by, I think, 60 or 70 percent. Wow. Amazingly. Yeah. So, so actually, it was very interesting. But meanwhile, you know, our fundraised income was down. But we were very fortunate because just before lockdown, we had this long awaited event at Sotheby's. And that was at the end of February and very early March. And we had been building up to this for a few years. And we had done these kind of amazing uh, embroidered artworks that had been, we'd worked with leading contemporary artists Mm. who included Ai Weiwei and uh, Bob and Roberta Smith and Wolfgang Tillmans and Cornelia Parker and, you know, huge, huge names. And they all had worked with us to create these embroidered artworks that were absolutely stunning. And so we auctioned them at Sotheby's and it was the the revenue and it was hugely successful. And the revenue from the sale of those embroidered artworks is what saw us through the pandemic, essentially. And it was a huge boost to all the prisoners and, and also just to the whole charity. It was the most incredible event. I mean, it blew me away being up so mm, close mm. to these works. And Ai Weiwei, you know, his piece, yeah. incredible. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it was extraordinary sort of seeing, you know what I was saying about the the stitching actually being a bit like handwriting. Mm-hmm. So the kind of intimacy of just seeing these stitched works, all like painting, so so that they, they were art. And I think the sort of this realisation that we could stitched works could be works of art was very important. And actually, it came from one of our trustees, Kath Kidston, who kind of had this insight and had the idea for the event. And there you go. Katie, what would you say has challenged you most so far? And what have you learned from it? What has challenged me most so far? I think for me, it was it was setting up a, an organisation. <laughs> I mean, I kind of got the cause and loved the volunteers and was sort of, you know, could could sort of cope with the prison system and negotiate it. But I think actually, Fine Cell Work started one day a week from my bedroom, and I had worked for a hippie theatre company before that, well, and, and done a PhD. So I had no proper work experience whatsoever. And suddenly this kind of thing started growing up around me, and we took on more and more staff, and there was more and more responsibility, and there were kind of legal things, and there was HR, and I really had never worked, had never had a proper job before, actually. So that was a huge learning curve for me. And it's just incredibly satisfying to see that Fine Cell Work is now a highly professional, well-run, happy, medium-sized charity from from where it started. And that is down to other people. That's down to our executive director, Victoria, and the team that are there. And it is wonderful to see it's kind of, it's it's like a little seed. (laughs) and It's grown into a good, good, solid tree. How easy was it to sort of take more of a backward seat with the charity? Well, not particularly easy, really, because I think, yes and no, but I needed it badly. So I'd become a late mother. We adopted our daughter, Chloe, um, 11 years ago. And I was still running the charity when we adopted her. And it was, and the charity, meanwhile, also had, well, it had grown very fast. And then sales started to plateau. So in the first sort of what, 15, 10, 10, 15 years, sales just went up dramatically year on year. And I kind of thought that would continue. I had no experience of running a business. And actually, apparently, businesses do grow fast in their early years. And then kind of, then it just started. And then we had huge, huge success in 2009 and 2010. And the chat and Fine Cell become it became a lot better known. So it had always grown. The prisoners had always wanted. We'd always taken on more volunteers. I saw that as my job was just to grow it, to set up more groups, to sell more needlework, to make more, make sure more prisoners were able to do the work. 
but it grew without enough infrastructure, in fact. And um, I mean, the, the infrastructure was growing too, but it sort of grew faster than the infrastructure. And then in 2009, we became a Times charity, a Times Christmas charity, which is a huge coup for a small charity. And we had huge donations, huge interest. And we didn't really have the infrastructure to carry it. And at the same time, we had, as well as being a Times charity, we were just about to exhibit a quilt at a national exhibition at the V&A of British quilting. And the quilt was almost like a centerpiece and it had a film next to it with prisoners and volunteers talking. And people were really captivated by it. And over and over again, after that, I would meet people who said, oh, I saw your thing in the V&A. And they just kind of couldn't believe it. And the quilt was really very moving. And it was about prison life. It was actually a sort of quilt about prison in a way. So there was the Times, there was the V&A. Then we had a huge commission at for English heritage at Dover Castle. And at the same time, a wall hanging that had been commissioned by the Jerwood Foundation at the Sage Concert Hall in Newcastle. And all these events happened within six months. And I'd kind of set them up years before and they finally, finally all happened. Not all of them years before, but sort of. And it was just, it was almost, it almost broke me actually. It was just too much. We didn't have enough planning and systems in place. And everyone sort of wanted fine cell work and thought it was marvellous. But it was just, it was a lot of work. <laughs> it was a lot of work. And for someone who's not really a, a structures, I wasn't someone, I'm not, not a natural planner. <laughs> it was a bit much. <laughs> Who would you say has been your biggest influence, Katie? I would say uh, two things. It's Lady Antry and the prisoners themselves. And I think that Lady Antry was really, I, I just loved her. And she was loved by many people. Um, she was unusual and funny and special. She was kind of original. And I learned from her. She was wise. And um, she was an influence on me. Her kind of, she just was because of the kind of person she was. And also because I think she, I think she kind of got me and she gave me a free hand. And that was an enormous uh, privilege, actually. She really didn't tell me what to do. And she was someone who believed in people making their own mistakes. Uh, hence her love for prisoners. <laughs> and uh, so she sort of let me make my own mistakes and learn from them. And um, yeah, that was a very nice thing to do. It wasn't always easy f for me or her. <laughs> so anyway, Lady Anne was a good, big influence um, and her sort of compassion and her sense of justice and her imagination. And then I think the prisoners, just because you realise that they're not so different from you. And that's an important thing to understand and to grasp. And it's very kind of rewarding because it actually to let go of some of one's barriers to empathy, we all have a common humanity. And so I think that I think I've learned from the people we work with, actually, I've learned about myself just through learning more about them. Now, my tummy is rumbling. And so we are going to accelerate into the chocolate break. Yay. And Katie has picked uh, some chocolates that we haven't had on the show, which is really exciting. And they are the Booja Booja Sea Salt Truffles. We've got almond caramel, I think we've got. V they're vegan and they're organic and they've won 22 awards and they're made in Norfolk and they've been made since 1999. And I haven't eaten one for a long, long time. So Katie, why Booja Booja? Oh, a friend gave me some, a friend who is a chocoholic, mm -hmm. and I just love them. I just love the smoothness of them, and it's kind of cool that they're vegan. And actually, the thing is, they don't um, sort of, they're not so heavy in your stomach, as I think, because of that. They're absolutely you can, delicious. So you, can, you can eat more. <laughs> yeah, you can eat more, and I love that cocoa powder finish. It yeah, reminds really me of lovely. a really old-fashioned chocolate truffle. <laughs> I know, they're too good, aren't they? They're too good. So, Katie, normally we talk about the founders' well-being at this stage, but I know that you wanted to speak about the prisoners' well-being. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think in the last 10 or 20 years, prisoners' well-being has become centre stage in a way, because I think there's, and health, there's more of an understanding that in prison people get sick, actually. So they may also have all kinds of sicknesses and sadnesses and griefs of the mind, and they do in their bodies as well, because they don't get enough exercise, they don't eat properly, and they are often very unhappy. Mm. And they are frightening places. A lot of people in prison are frightened as well. 
They're frightened of the other prisoners. They're frightened of the officers or whatever. So, so prisons are unhealthy places where people are cooped up for long periods and have nothing to do. And unhappiness is also unhealthy, is it not? Depression is, is, is actually a form of illness. So there's more understanding that prisoners need well-being. And fine cell work, I think, gives that well-being. I think the connection with volunteers, the social side of the classes that we were talking about, and the kind of sense of self-worth, um, and actually just a, a busy hands, mm. soothes and calms the mind. And I think Lady Anne understood that very, very well. That actually, and her daughter told me that she always would say, you know, if the girls was kind of bored or fractious, she would kind of get them using their hands or doing something, and often sewing. And so prisoners have said to me, one said recently, I asked, said, what did you get from fine cell work? And she said, inner peace. And that is a huge thing. I mean, that's the thing we all need and crave, isn't it? It is. It's an almost form of a meditation in a way. Yes, that's right. It is. And many have, I've, I've spoken to prisoners who said they prayed while they were sewing. So I think, I think it's a huge contributor to well-being. And I've also heard that, I've heard that the people have said, officers and prisoners have said, a fine cell work prisoner is a good prisoner. Now, I don't think they really, what they mean is they're not getting in fights and mm -hmm. they're not causing problems. And I think part of that is because they're calmer and happier. So I think understanding the link between well-being and behavior and, and sort of morals in a way is, is quite important. And um, that's what I always loved about Lady Anne's idea was that she just saw, you know, they don't have any money and we expect them to come out and be all good. <laughs> well, would you be? came out and you had 40 quid and no friends and no home. So I think, I think there's a kind of materiality to morality as well. I think also it gives the prisoners a sense mm. of purpose, you know, with your kids. Mm. There's a goal, there's something for them which is going to potentially challenge them, but give them huge rewards. The financial, yes, but also, as you were saying, it's the mental side of things. It's a shame that there seems to be a lack of physical well-being in prisons factored into their timetable from what yeah. I understand no there is and, and more and more I mean imagine imagine the 23-hour lockdown and not being able to get exercise we felt it all in lockdown how awful it was being cooped up all the time there's a physical dimension and also I think that many people in prison 70% of them have mental health problems some disorders of one sort or another and if they didn't before they went to prison they, they very likely might get get some kind of mental health issue in prison and the work actually alleviates that mental distress. And I think having something to do and having a sense of purpose. So you're talking about getting something finished. Imagine if you have suicidal thoughts and suicide rates in prison are quite high, much, much higher than the, the national average and the norm. You, you want to finish that before you want to kill yourself, right? There's something, there's a purpose, right? There's something you want to get done. And people have said that to me, that the sense of purpose sort of saw them through very dark periods. And the sense of being needed by customer someone was waiting for their work that's so so it's also being connected to other people isn't it you're needed it's very profound so Katie would you share with us where you've had to have hope and wonderful patience <laughs> um hope I think I've always had hope for the people we work with and that's what I really love about the charity I think it's a privilege to be involved in a form of work which is about generating hope in other people. If they have hope, and we talk a lot about hope. In fact, we've just done a new cushion. It's got a wonderful slogan on it. Hope is the key. Oh, wow. I, <laughs> I know. And one. it's got a wonderful kind of huge kind of jangling keys, like prison keys in the middle. Oh, hope brilliant. is the key. Isn't that lovely? And I just, I think, I think hopefulness is something we try to generate and we see how much good it, because if you don't have hope, you're in despair and there's no point going on, is there? Mm -hmm. And honestly, a lot of people inside feel that way. Hope, it's for the prisoners. And also I think just hope, hopefulness about the charity. I really believe that it, it always has grown. It can continue to grow. I believe prisons can be hopeful places and not places of despair. And I think that's what we've seen. And that should be how they're run, with trying to generate hope in people. So, and then patience. I think, <laughs> I think for me, it just it's it's a sort of lifetime work. Is just learning to be more patient because I think fine cell work, the, the kind of pressure in the early years of doing so much and being responsible for so much, made me rush everything <laughs> and try to get too much done and take shortcuts. And uh, it felt like that was the only way I could sort of do three people's jobs. 
or for whatever it was. And I've learned to slow down, I think. And so I think it's patience for me is about sort of taking things at the right pace as well. It's a real leveller patience, mm, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, Katie, where can our lovely listeners find out more about Fine Cell Work, either as a customer or as a volunteer, and also hopefully get on board with your crowdfunding, which is going through the roof for your yes. 25th celebration yeah. uh, book? I mean, it's incredible how that has just completely flipped. Um, but also, but but basically, yeah, just let it, let the lovely listeners know where where they can find you. You can find us at our website, findcellwork.co.uk, and you can buy all sorts of things there, beautiful embroidered cushions and small items and bags. And we will, one of our slogans is we'll, we'll sew anything for money. So <laughs> you can also, <laughs> you can also um, get, get all, commission as well, you can commission anything, embroidered chair seats, cushions with a picture of your dog on. Uh, so the website is the place to go. And there is a link on the website to our crowdfunder, which is this beautiful, beautiful book. And it has gone through the roof that we are publishing for our 25th anniversary. And we're kind of we're raising money for the publishing costs and then money from sales of the book after the costs are covered. will go back to find sell work. It's a wonderful book. It's for our 25th anniversary. It's got 25 different product stories in it, stories about find sell work products and just i think i think what we've realized from the crowdfunder is that there's a there's a, there's such a hunger and a passion for these stories and for redemptive stories and katie also for, on the volunteer side of which i'm one of your volunteers they find that on the website too yes absolutely you can you can um, join us as a volunteer on the website and i would say actually it's for you to speak amelia i i mean i think volunteering for fine cell work and in the kind of prisons world is one of the most rewarding forms of volunteering. It is, I mean, it is the most incredible thing that I have ever done. It's moved me to places that I hadn't visited before. I learned so much. The insight was incredible. It's rewarding. My mentee was the biggest star. I believed in her from the word go, and I still do. And every slap she got back you know every time she moved forward she got slapped down again she each time she rose to it and she just plowed through and and finally uh she's been rewarded with a job but it the the one lesson that I learned from my mentee well, I learned loads but the one that just resonates and I've told this to her and I I share it with others is it's not moving on it's moving forward from what has been before and I think that's really powerful. So I would really recommend it. You need to uh, commit. You need to be consistent. You need to be reliable. And you will you will learn so much about the system, the frustrations. Gosh, I had so many and I still yeah, do. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, find cell work are the most amazing team to work for. Because if ever you feel concerned about areas, there's always the support and the reassurance. And I love it. I just... I. I'm so happy that I happened to walk into your shop because I love tapestry, <laughs> yeah. got chatting, of course. And then, you know, lovely Caroline, one of your um, <laughs> oldest got volunteers, you got yeah. me on board. And mm. and I just think it's one of the most rewarding things to give people give back to society and to try and give people another chance. Yeah. And, and I would just add that you, you know what you said about believing in your mentee. Well, that is such a, the people we work with have often have from very early on have had no self-belief and have very often been damaged, had damaging childhood experiences. And so just believing in someone who has lost self-belief and who other people don't believe in because they've committed an offense and, you know, they are to be uh, sort of feared, as it were. Um, it's just a huge thing to do. And it, and it is, you've done it. And oh, that is that is the kind of frontline role of our volunteers. I would recommend it. So, Katie, I would love to say the hugest of thank yous for coming on the show and sharing with us all there is, or not really. I mean, it's just an in a small <laughs> snippet about fine cell work. But it's been brilliant to hear more, to understand more. And thank you very, very much. Thank you. It's been thank you for having us on the show. We, we, we feel lucky. And um, let's hope people go to our website because there's wonders to be seen there. <laughs> anyway, before I go, it's time for my book recommendation. 
and for the quote for this final episode in this series. So the recommendation is a book written by a chocolate friend and the most wonderful editor of a newspaper. And he is called Andrew Baker and his book is From Bean to Bar, A Chocolate Lover's Guide to Britain. So if any of you are exploring the UK for your summer, buy this book and he will take you on a chocolate journey. And the quote is also a chocolate quote and it's from a line that Tom Hanks says in the film Forrest Gump. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. A huge thank you for finding the show. Don't forget to hop back into the archives if you've only just discovered Hope and Patience. So this is our last episode in Series 3. I hope you've enjoyed our guests' insights and chat as much as I have. H&P will be back in the autumn for Series 4. For the exact date, just keep an eye on socials or subscribe to our newsletter. Have a wonderful summer. Make sure you take time for you. I'll be working on a new chocolate project hoping to get the chance to do a lot of reading and chilling and conjuring up series four. Don't forget to subscribe, follow to be kept up to speed with episodes. And if you're enjoying the show, it would be truly fab if you could rate and review it or better still share it with folk who may value a gem or two. Any book recommendations, quotes, songs can be found in the show notes and on the website too. Until the autumn, however tough your times get, Keep that very special inner sparkle you have shining and have a truly wonderful summer. Hope and Patience with Amelia Rope. Join the conversation at hopeandpatience.co.uk. Find Amelia on Facebook at Hope and Patience or on Twitter and Instagram at Amelia underscore Rope.